Please open your Bibles to the book of 2 John, I believe. I might change that passage because I could be wrong about that. Before we begin our passage, fresh review, remember the Christian balance of submission to government, patri patriotism versus following the Lord and how much we should be wary of overt patriotism. I've explained a lot of interesting things on that. And I've also taught you that there is a Christian foundation and it is not found in the Declaration of Independence document nor the rest of the Constitution. All of it is not much different from other secular beginnings of governments and worlds. There's only one thing that can, you can argue is Christian and is, it is from the Baptist distinctive. It is the First Amendment. It is the first part, the first rule that talks about the freedom of speech where we get religious liberty. Now, there's a reason why they put religious liberty in freedom of speech. What's the reason? Not to defend CNN and those crooked channels. It's because of more so of religious liberty. That was the context. That's why they put that within freedom of speech. They didn't put CNN. They didn't put ABC. They didn't even put Fox. They're able to enjoy, remember, that freedom of speech because of the independent Baptist distinctive. So they should be praising us Baptists, not criticizing us Baptists, because they wouldn't have the freedom of speech to criticize us Baptists to begin with if it weren't for us. Now, I'm not going to park it on that one. But the point is that the Baptist distinctive is the only Christian foundation, one. Secondly, the... Christian foundation is because a lot of Baptists were involved in the American Revolutionary Wars or even their distinctives were involved in the beginnings of America for the first Thanksgiving all the way through, uh, let's see right here, the first Thanksgiving to the American Revolutionary War and the Baptists who were rebelling against the church state which was Anglican or Calvinist branches, believe it or not, not Catholic, not Catholic but the Protestant branches. So that's why we can say America has some kind of Christian beginning. But remember, holistically, it is not. Holistically, it is not. If you recall, the majority of founding fathers are deists. So because they are deists, that doesn't mean they're Christians. They just believe in a God, and that's pretty much it. If you read uh, some of the quotes from some of the founding fathers on what they said about Christianity. You can find some good things, but you can also find some bad things. You can find some bad things, but I'm not going to spend time uh, pointing out some of the bad things that they say because that's pretty much easy to find. But however, it is hard to find some kind of Christian roots or Baptist distinctives because of our liberal schools and revisionist history. It's more easy to find problems with the beginnings of the country because uh, revisionist uh, liberal schools are good with that one. They don't really love their country that much, okay? They all want to be like Ukraine or some, something else. I don't know. So the point is that that's the reason why I don't have to really uh, point you the quotes of the errors of our beginnings in America because pretty much anyone can find that or hear about that. However, it is hard to talk about the Baptist distinctives which is why I had to give you some quotes about that. And like I told you before, even some deists could be a little bit more Christian than current Baptist churches today, which is why there is that, there's no doubt a strong Christian influence or root uh, more prone back then than it is today. That's the only reason why I would say that America can be considered a Christian nation, but then again, it's only in those senses, and it's very small. Holistically, and the national perspective, people-wise, they are not. They are not. They just had a little bit more of fear of God. That's about it. It's not a Bible-believing perspective. Now, as we continue on, we're going to look at 2 John. Okay, we're going to, we're going to turn to 2 John. And then I'm going to read you some verses here, which is interesting. We start off at verse 7, verse 7. The Apostle John warns that there's going to be infiltrators inside the Christian churches. 
infiltrators inside the Christian churches. This is wrong doctrine, but we're going to find out in history it can be even deeper than wrong doctrine. It can be the destruction of people itself. Remember, wrong doctrine is so important to stand against as Christians. You might say, why? Because if you approve one doctrine, then you can approve another wrong doctrine to another wrong doctrine to another wrong belief or another wrong teaching. That's why you got to realize Nazism, communism, where millions have died or murdered pretty much, is not born just because, just because of greed. It's because of a belief. It's because of a doctrine. That's why. Beliefs are so important to greedy leaders, tyrannical leaders, to control the people. That's important to understand. That's why, as Bible believers, we stand strong against wrong doctrine. Amen. All right, 2 John 1, 7. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Masons and Jesuits, I would say, in that verse. And we're going to find out in our history uh, what makes them not believers in Christ, why they deny Jesus Christ. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God he that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. So that's a very urgent warning that God gives that the Bible-believing Christians should not tolerate, should not compromise with people of wrong doctrine Amen. because they can infiltrate and seep in their influence into the Bible believing churches. Now look at 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. This is a scary warning. This is why you're going to find out in your history the Jesuits and Masons can qualify for this. They can pretend to act like you and there are O's that actually say that, which is pretty scary, but then they do it pretentiously, and their insidious plan is to destroy. But anyway, second, uh, 1 John 2.19, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would, have, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. That's pretty scary. That's pretty scary. And the Bible warns about that people who seem like Christians, act like Christians, but they are actually not Christians. But they infiltrate and they don't continue. Instead, they get out and then cause a great evil. And I'm going to explain about this through the infamous Illuminati. Illuminati. It was born during that time. It's amazing. Now, you got to remember this. There is one unbroken lesson from the beginning of Genesis to the end that not even dispensationalism changes. The unbroken stream is you see good versus evil. Mankind's failure in every dispensation, their evil side. But then there's a good that the Lord's working within human nature as well. And there's that battle, that conflict every time in history. So evil never left. So when you study history, you have to look at the devil as well. It's so important to study the history of satanic workings, not to dig so deep that you become a paranoid freak about witchcraft, occultism, and conspiracies, okay? Uh, you, a lot of those people who are infatuated with that, you'd be surprised how much Bible they don't know, yeah, except true. the book of Revelation, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> so that shows that they don't know much about the history of their own people, of their own God, and that's a history you ought to know more than evil. Amen. However, I say more than evil, which means that you sh that doesn't mean you should neglect knowing the history of evil. You got to know the history of that, too. Uh, Christian churches will just talk about the fruits of the spirit, but they don't talk about the satanic workings behind the scenes. That's why I believe it's important to know about this kind of stuff, not to get to so deep into it, but at least an awareness, some sort of awareness. Let's review. Look at the satanic working, which is why the timing of the Illuminati is very important if you understand your enemy or if you want to be the enemy that wants to destroy the Christians. The Baptists have their religious liberty. Now, once they have their religious liberty and they're able to plant something, isn't that a threat to the enemy? That is. That's the reason why he wants to stamp out the church. 
He always did that. That's why the Great Awakening Revival was so important. It was born because of such freedom and liberty. But now, England, they were de-establishing the Anglican Church. Not Baptist, Anglican. You might say, what? Well, why is that a big deal? That's a big deal because if they de-establish the Anglican Church within the Catholic territories, that means the Catholics, they can do what they want in their territories with their church-state mindset. Remember the French and Indian War? Uh, I don't want to review the whole thing, but I'll have to do it, okay? Mm -hmm. Then I'll jump to Illuminati, okay? It's important to understand the tactic of the enemy. It's so important that I actually want to go back to my history lesson and do it all over again, to be honest. It's so important that the French and Indian War that England won. Remember, these are the three big nations that uh, colonized the New World. France and Spain surrounded English territory. So Catholic encroachment. But England won the French and Indian War. Because of that, the Baptists are able to continue their freedom. But then England, they became more controlling of the colonists in America. And then the Quebec Act was what did it. The Quebec Act was dangerous where the Baptists felt threatened of their religious liberty and the Catholics can encroach. Because Quebec Act, that's related to Canada. You know, that's French Catholic territory there. So it was favoring more on their side where it could endanger the Baptists in America. That's why a lot of Baptists were involved in the American Revolutionary War. Coincidentally, this is literally just uh, two years prior to the American Revolution Revolutionary War, the Quebec Act. So it, you can see that it stirred them up. That was a big reason why. If they lost the American Revolutionary War, the Jesuits would have infiltrated America much sooner. But because uh, the Americans won in the Revolutionary War, it put a setback to the Jesuits in their system. You might say, why would they be able to infiltrate faster? Because if you recall in my last intermediate discipleship lesson on world history, the Jesuits were able to enjoy their freedom and power in spite of being kicked out by the Vatican, by Catherine the Great of Russia, and even in England. That's important to understand, even in England. And I gave you sources that the Jesuits were able to enjoy their power even more so during their time of depression, their exile from the Vatican, more so than the Dark Ages. That's why it was so important that they won the war that time. And you can tell there is undoubtedly a divine hand behind the scenes because George Washington, who became the first president, you might recall, he was baptized by a Baptist minister. So that shows very strongly that he could have been a saved Christian because Baptists are already indoctrinated that I cannot baptize unless you're a saved adult. Amen. That is very hardcore in Baptist uh, preachers and their history. And George Washington, during the French and Indian War, he was shot seven to nine times. But the natives, uh, one native told him after the American Revolutionary War that he was there back at the French and Indian War and shot him seven to nine times, but it never hit him. And then he claimed that it's because the Great Spirit told him, leave that man alone. Amen. And he told the other uh, natives, native soldiers, hey, leave that man alone. Don't shoot at that man. There's no doubt God's hand was behind the scene all the way from beginning to end. So it was that important. Otherwise, we wouldn't have the next great awakenings from religious liberty. That was born because the Americans won the American Revolutionary War. And remember, a lot of Baptists were siding with that and they were praying before they were shooting. And there were a lot of Baptist preachers who were soldiers during the American Revolutionary War. Now, remember, like I told you before, they had their faults, and I've given both sides of the Bible-believing perspectives. I'm not going to explain about that again. I went on a very long spiel on that, so I'm not gonna do it here. So don't criticize me. If you wanna criticize me, listen to my last video first before you criticize this one, and throw in a nasty, inconsiderate comment, because I wanna continue on with the lesson. I'm just simply explaining that even if they were in the wrong, that God can even use wrong for good. And God's hand was behind what they did through even if they were wrong, where they were able to continue spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why it was so important, both in good and bad deeds in their history, the Lord's hand was behind it and nevertheless used it.
I mean, you don't believe in that? Genghis Khan, I don't approve of his methods when he conquered and murdered many people. But didn't you know the Lord used Genghis Khan's evil where he was able to marry Nestorian Christian princesses and they were able to spread their own Christian belief. Amen. See, God will use good and evil, whatever, for his purpose. Good and evil is decided by man's free will. God don't force that to happen. But God can use any choice or will of mankind Amen. to give him glory because he's not going to waste his glory. That's how powerful your God is. All right. Now, I, now that I've explained that whole part and the importance of God's hand behind this, where we can enjoy our religious liberty and freedom, then what can the devil do? Catholic power, notice right here, is lost now. They lost it. That powerful stronghold of the Holy Roman Empire that went on like a millennia, a thousand years, ever since the beginning of the death of the apostles, you notice that Rome, that evil Roman Empire, that, that history never left New Testament church history. Ever since the beginning of the New Testament church, Rome will remain till the end of the tribulation. So Rome took over and the devil had a vic victory but then they had the uh, Vaudois, John Wycliffe, the Reformation that just shattered the Holy Roman Empire. And then what made it worse was when England got separated and the King James Bible was born. That really did the job. And then what made things worse was now America is its own independent nation that was born with Baptist, not Protestant. Not Lutheran, not Calvinist, but Baptist distinctive. You think the devil is going to say, hey, enjoy a good time? So he did something that would last till the end of the tribulation. He did something that would be permanently successful until Jesus Christ comes down at the second advent and conquers them. Pagan Rome fell, so the Roman Catholic Church was his biggest success. But that thing fell apart. How is he going to continue Roman power? It has to continue. The Jesuits came to the scene, and I explained to you last discipleship. The Jesuits, they were able to become powerful during their suppression and through the educated school systems and working with elites. So because they have a habit of working with elites, who do you think they're going to bump into? Who, what other religious secret club or society is good with the elites during that time? Freemasons. And I've given you documentations that Jesuits bumped into Freemasons. They did. And they had, a, uh, they had a working together during that time. I'm not going to explain it right here. But that was so important because there's no doubt in the beginnings of American history, even though there's Baptist distinctive born, like I told you, holistically, it's not a Christian nation because they had, uh, they had a lot of secularism, deism, and some kind of philosophy there. But there was also Freemasonry. Freemasonry was there that time. So uh, let me give you some interesting quotes from Dr. William Grady's book, How Satan Turned America Against God, on page 284. Let's first talk about the Freemasons. So remember, it's going to go to Jesuits, to Freemasons. Then once I explain Freemasons' infiltration in America, you're going to see these both combined together. When they combine together, there's a remnant that comes out here and a remnant that comes out here that, this, that these bad dudes came out. Okay? So I've explained these bad boys, but now let's explain these bad boys. Recoil and Revival. So the itinerant worker just up in, uh, let's see right here. In 1834, a joint committee of the Massachusetts legislature conducted a formal inquiry into Masonic activity and printed a 54-page report entitled An Investigation into Freemasonry. On page 14, we read, The organization of Freemasonry as a distinct independent government within our own government and beyond the control of the laws of the land by means of its secrecy and the oaths and regulations which its subjects are bound to obey under penalties of death have occupied much of the intention of the committee in connection with the third branch of their inquiry. End of quote that Grady is documenting. He's quoting a documented source. With the arrival of a new generation of conspiracy fodder, the power of the lodge was reestablished in the land. 
Though only 10% of the electorate in 1872 were Masons, they constituted 75% of active government officials. John Marshall, a former Chief Justice of the United States, was eventually able to extricate himself from the Lodge and warn his fellow Americans, quote, the institution of masonry ought to be abandoned as one capable of much evil and incapable of producing any good which might be affected by safe and open means. In his book, Freemasonry and the Vatican, oh, that's interesting, right? Maybe a good book to read. Ponsons explain why masonry and politics can be such an explosive mixture. Freemasonry imposes a rigid discipline on its members, and the various Grand Lodges at least are strict on one point. Freemasons occupying political posts owe obedience, above all else, to the orders and directives of Masonry. The order does not always manage to obtain this unconditional obedience, but it always insists upon it as the Mason's duty. De Ponsons continues on, from, and he quotes from the, official, from the official covenant of the Grand Orient of their Masonic philosophy. So he takes it straight from the horse's mouth. It says right here, politicians who are Masons and who are consequently in some degree emissaries of the order should remain subject to it during their term of office. As politicians, they must be guided by the work of the General Assembly but in every circumstance of their political life, they have a duty to obey those principles which govern us. They must be non-biased people then when they run our political offices. Mm -hmm. They must be very innocent people. Oh, it's just a club, you know, they always say, to find uh, connections with social powers. Yeah, that's scary because you don't look at their doctrines, their beliefs. It is in our lodges that our brethren will acquire a philosophical spirit. Let us guard it lovingly, for it is the secret of political influence. We must exercise constant control. We must hear and question all those of our brethren who by their professions touch on politics, the law, or administration. Well, I have family members who are in those Masonic clubs. They don't seem to be that way. It's simple. It's the same thing with like a lot of Baptists who don't know their doctrines and they attend Baptist churches. But those who believe in those doctrines and study and are in the higher order and they're hardcore about it? Mm -hmm. That's okay? Good. That's a good way to put it. Now, anyways, continuing on. Whenever a God-fearing patriot discovers the darker side of masonry, he will inevitably be puzzled at the impressive list of prominent Americans, especially among the founding fathers, who were purported to have been masons. Moses Richardson, the grand treasurer of the Grand Encampment of Massachusetts and Rhode Island, testified at the investigation of masonry in Rhode Island, December 1831 through January 1832. Now, this is a Masonic claim that all the presidents of the United States, except the two Adams, were Masons. Now, this is a problem then. How are we going to explain about George Washington and then other presidents who were possibly or even likely saved? So then how do we explain this dilemma? Grady believes that it's more simple than you think. Answer is simple. The Masons are lying through their aprons. Now you might say, why is that? Because it is the habit of Satan's powerful people and elites to always lie to you. And if you don't believe that, then you should look at t today's elites. All the world agrees with us. All the big shots believe with us. And you should see all... They always lie to you. You believe them the past two years, your elites? They always lie, man. They always lie to you. Majority, there are just millions and millions of Americans who side with us, except the small group of people who are disgruntled about the way we do things the past two years. Liars, liars, liars. Pants on fire, man. That's why they have to have Google to lie to you about the number of subscribers and comments and views to make it look like that the majority of people agree with liberal propaganda and then make the Christian side even smaller in the views, in the subscription list, and etc. Making us look like we're a minority and something like that. So it's the devil's people and elites who have always lied, so you don't believe what they say. 
Now, this is what Thomas Jefferson wrote. I know no safe depository of the ultimate powers of society, but the people themselves. And if we think them not enlightened enough to exercise their control with a wholesome discretion, the remedy is not to take it from them, but to inform their discretion by education. Now, Jefferson, if you know the man, he is not a big fan of elitist power and control. He is a heavy fan of people having their rights. So for him to be a Mason... ...you the subject of your communication. Ignorant as I was of the true character of Masonry, and little informed as I was on the grounds on which its extermination was contended for, and incapable as I was, and am in my situation of investigating the controversy, I never was a Mason. And no one perhaps could be more a stranger to the principles, rights, and fruits of the institution. I had never regarded it as dangerous or noxious, nor on the other hand, as deriving importance from anything publicly known of it. From the number and character of those who now support the charges against masonry, I cannot doubt that it is at least susceptible of abuses outweighing any advantages promised by its patron, patrons. With this apologetic explanation, I tender you, sir, my respectful and cordial salutations. What did he mean by that? Now, this is very important because the uh, conspiracy theorists, they're very amateur in their history. Okay, they always try to find a conspiracy rather than looking at something historical or a holistic historical perspective. It is true you can find, now this is important for you Bible believers to understand, they're going to find connections of masonry with even great awakening revival preachers that I'm going to show you later on. You're going to hear about Sam Jones, maybe even Charles Spurgeon, oh, well. and politicians, George Washington. You see pictures of him wearing a Masonic apron. Uh, perhaps even James Madison, Thomas Jefferson, other stuff like that. But what's the simple explanation why they're not Masons? You forgot what I told you before. Okay? What I told you before, it's the same thing. Uh, not every Mason is, let's kill the whole world, okay? Why? Because majority of the people just go there to find what? Connections. If you're a rich guy or you're an elitist, and even preachers during that time, they were very popular. Why were they popular that time? Not today. Because American people that time were more God-fearing, okay? So because they were more God-fearing, they elevated them and used them as their leaders, actually. So if you have a leadership position during those days, inevitably, you're going to bump into the Masons. Why? It's the Masons' job to be friends with a bunch of elitists and rulers. Why? So that they can be powerful themselves. Is that unfortunate? Of course it's unfortunate. You know why? These people, like Madison even admitted, they're not informed of Masonry. It's called a secret club, okay? It's a secret club. They have no idea. They just think like, for example, if a Christian wants to work with poor people, sometimes they will have to go to uh, a humanitarian organization who can make up most of charismatics. Mm -hmm. and, when, and what you do as a minister, if you have a big ministry and you want to work with poor people, but you need a humanitarian organization, it's inevitable you're going to bump into them. People who are just like, oh, 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 they have no idea how to run a ministry or to increase it and work with real life people. They're so used to being isolated at home, so it's so easy for them to judge anybody being connected or tied to anybody. Do you realize that? Do you realize that? There are Baptist pastors who can't afford their own building, so then they'll have to rent from other buildings who are of different religions. <laughs> Okay? And they think, oh, it's so blasphemy. You know, you're part of the elite system and stuff like that. You know why? You're, you're the loser who's stuck at home growing a beard out in the middle of the woods and just complaining stuff online. Amen. You don't work with real life people. You know why? You fail every time you work with real life people. I guarantee that your ministry failed. And so because of that, you became bitter and mad and you can find your supporters only online. Did I hurt your feelings? Did I, hit your, did I hit your heart somewhere? So that's the reason why we must understand 
that eat, like Schofield, for example, they'll, co they'll connect him to the Lo Lotus, I think White Lotus Society, and then they'll connect that to some kind of secret elitist club and etc. So they always do that kind of stuff, but it is common during that time, during those days. Not now, okay? Not now, because the preachers have really dropped down, okay? So we can't hold hands with the elitist clubs now, especially with the knowledge we know. But during that time, one, they didn't have much knowledge about that. Number two, the preachers at that time are not really low lackeys like us. They're really up there. I mean, if you look at Billy Sunday's house, his portraits, he was friends with, uh, yeah, he has portraits of uh, all the presidents of the United States during that time. Why? Because it was common that those people would uh, befriend him or even meet him. Because that preacher has a large influence in their state, in their terrains. So those politicians have to befriend or know those preachers. You don't know real life. All right? Now, I'm not going to give you a whole lesson on real life and, uh, you know, how to be not anti, uh, how to not be an Amish who's uh, and a, a, a loser online. I'm not going to get talk to you about real life, how to be a real life person working with real life people. That should just be common sense, okay? You all should know that. So that's what happened. So that's why Madison, for example, even if he bumped into some of those meetings, he had no idea that time. And like I gave you from his quote, he wasn't really speaking against it, but nor was he publicly endorsing it either. But now, like he said, he hears some of the suspicious information about them. He says that they're very least sus susceptible of abuses. So that explains about George Washington as well. So here's an, uh, here's an example. Straight from the horse's mouth, George Washington writes to Reverend, uh, Reverend Snyder because Reverend Snyder was concerned about the Masons. Now you've got to realize during that time, Masons were infiltrating during Washington's days. But the, the politician presidents didn't know about that. So there were some preachers warning about that. So Reverend, Reverend Snyder was one example. So then Washington assured him and wrote back, 25th September 1798, page 290 in Grady's book, he has the exact letter. Sir, uh, Washington writes to the Reverend Mr. Snyder, Sir, many apologies are due to you for my not acknowledging the receipt of your obliging favor of the 22nd uh, ULT dot, I don't know what that is, and for not thanking you at an earlier period for the book you had the goodness to send me. I have heard much of the nefarious and dangerous plan and doctrines of the Illuminati, but never saw the book until you were pleased to send it to me. The same causes which have prevented my acknowledging the receipt of your letter, I uh, have prevented my reading the book hitherto, namely the, multiplici the multiplicity of matters which pressed upon me before and the uh, debilitated state in which I was left after, a severe fever had been removed and which allows me to add a little more now than thanks for your kind wishes and favorable sentiments, except to correct an error you have run into of my presiding over the English lodges in this country. Did you hear what he said? Yeah. He said that was an error. The fact is, I preside over none nor have I been in one more than once or twice within the last 30 years. See, they just happened to take that one picture that time. Yeah. Why do you think Masons want to put that in their club? Because that's their prideful day. Hey, the president of the United States went to our club. And obviously they're going to retain that picture. Yeah. And you're going to pull that out and say, see, he's a Mason. <laughs> it's the same thing like yours truly, you know. And when he's preaching, and, and then, you know, in front of a Catholic building, or you see my presence in a Catholic building, and they post that picture, and they say, he's See, he's a Jesuit! Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. Some of these people don't have common sense. I believe, notwithstanding, that none of the lodges in this country are contaminated with the principles ascribed to the Society of the Illuminati. With respect, I am, sir, your obedient and humble servant, George Washington. So that should be evidence right there, but the evidence is also a painting. If you go to William Jewell College, Liberty, Missouri, go to the lobby of John Gano Chapel. Now remember, John Gano is the Baptist minister, and he was heavily involved in the American Revolutionary War. They have a painting of the Baptist minister, John Gano, baptizing George Washington. Okay? Um, 
I want to show you that picture, but I got to keep reading this book. If any of you have a, want to see it, you can ask me, okay? And then I'll show you that picture later on. Now that we understand about this, <coughs> we can see Freemasonry has infiltrated America. There's no doubt about that. Actually, John Adams, I got to give a quote from John Adams right here. This is what he said about the Masons. They realize that they're dangerous people. Let's see right here. Mm, I don't have his quote here. I'm going to have to probably pull it up at a different page later on. If I find it, then I'll give you uh, John Adams' quote against the, a warning about the Masons. But anyway, if we were to resume on, yeah. then the Masons, they were able to infiltrate America and we see how they were even trying to infiltrate. You see that? They were trying to infiltrate the presidents, the politicians. That's their job. That way they can garner up more control. That's why they are a very dangerous group. Here it is, John Quincy Adams, page 275 of Grady's books. John Quincy Adams, the sixth president of the United States, warned in 1833, I do conscious, uh, conscientiously and sincerely believe that the order of Freemasonry, if not the greatest, is one of the greatest moral and political evils under which the Union is now laboring. Hmm. He warned about that. He knew that the Union, that they're dabbling with Freemasonry, and that, there are, that these Freemasons are dangerous people. Okay, now that we understand about the history of Freemasonry infiltration, now what about the Illuminati? Now, I gave you quotes before, and I'll uh, repeat just one or two again. The Illuminati was born from a person named Adam Weishaupt. That's a very important name. If it wasn't for this guy, you wouldn't get your current elites or globalists today. This is the guy that started everything. If you want to go technically way, way back, then you can go way, way back to Ignatius Loyola and blame him when he started the Jesuit order. That was actually the first secret society with their first secret oath and everything. Adam Weishaupt is just borrowing from the Jesuit order. And I'm going to show you that. This is from G.B. Nicolini's book, History of the Jesuits, and it, was a, it won the Scholar's Choice Award. This is what he said on pages 356 as well as 357. The edition is in 1889. During the order suppression from 1773 to 1814, so during the Jesuits, their exile, remember, when they were kicked out by the Vatican, by Pope Clement XIV, General Ricci, so that's the... Superior General of the Jesuits, the guy in charge. General Ricci created the Order of the Illuminati with his soldier Adam Weishaupt uniting the house of Rothschild. So that's a Jewish banker. With the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits. Oh, then this is a big problem right here. Because in the Illuminati consists of Masons. Now a lot of people know about. So there's no doubt they were working together here and there. Anyways, uh, let me read you some quotes. Grady's book on the Illuminati, page 298. The reader will recall President Washington's reply to Reverend Snyder, dated 7, September 25, 1798. Washington wrote, I have heard much of the nefarious and dangerous doctrines of the Illuminati. End of quote. The word Illuminati is Latin for enlightened ones. Kind of from the French. Why do you think they had a pervasive influence during the French Enlightenment? Mm. Because the French Enlightenment's doctrine was attractive to Adam Weishaupt. Why do you think Satan said, Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Your eyes shall be open. Enlightenment. 
Enlightened Ones, Illuminati, was a name given to the secret fraternity established by Dr. Adam Weishaupt, esteemed professor of canon law at the Jesuit University of Ingolstadt. Oh, wow. Born on February 6, 1748, Dr. Weishaupt received his own formal training from Bavarian Jesuits, but later turned on the Society of Jesus with an implacable vengeance. The Order of the Illuminati was founded on the uncanny date of May the 1st, 1776, with five charter members. While America was born in 1776, May the 1st became the high and holy day of her anti-nemesis international communism. Would you believe that? Would you believe that? Man, what perfect timing, huh? The month that Weishaupt and his four fellow conspirators began their satanic society was also coincidental from another perspective. Mm -hmm. wow. Because five is the number of death, Grady is arguing. But we're not going to get to that. If you have questions on that, then ask one of our people or ask me. I will tell you why the Bible number five is death. <laughs> Each of the charter members chose fanciful pseudonyms with Weishaupt's being Spartacus. Okay, that's important because I'm going to quite often mention Spartacus here. Whenever I mention Spartacus, that's in reference to Adam Weishaupt, okay? That's his pseudonym. Kind of like how actors have their own name, pseudonyms, right? Where do people learn all this stuff from? But anyway. Despite the reference in one of his letters to our worst enemies, the Jesuits, Weishaupt determined to pattern his organization after that of his former mentors. The Jesuit Barul, quoting Mirabu, writes that Weishaupt, quote, admired above all those laws that regime of the Jesuits, which under one head made men dispersed over the universe tend towards the same goal. He felt that one could imitate their methods while whilst holding views diametrically opposed, end of quote. The Jesuit method of mind control was a high priority area. Once again, on the evidence of Mirabeau, de Luchet, and von Knieg, I think, Barul says elsewhere, quote, It is here that Weishaupt appears especially to have wished to assimilate the regime of the sect to that of the religious orders and above all that of the Jesuits by the total abandonment of their own will and judgment, which he demands of his adepts. You forgot about that? About Loyola, when he founded the Jesuit order? To forsake their own will and everything. To be like poor, blind slaves and soldiers, dedicated, committed to the cause. Yeah. Along this line, Webster writes, the quote, the art of secret societies has always been to seek out physical, and mental degenerates and work upon their minds until they have roused them to the requisite degree of revolutionary fervor." End of quote. With a more specific application to Weishaupt's order, she adds, quote, "...the art of Illuminism lay in enlisted dupes as well as adepts, and by encouraging the dreams of honest visionaries or the schemes of fanatics, by flattering the vanity of ambitious egoists, by working on unbalanced brains, or by playing on such passions as greed of gold or power, to make men of totally divergent aims serve the secret purpose of the sect. Page 302, Adam's Awakening. Weishaupt's own descent into the world of the occult was brought about by a mysterious Jutland merchant known as Colmer. Some believe that Colmer was himself initiated into the Eastern Mysteries by an Ismaili holy man during an extended sojourn in Egypt. Others contend that he was a Gobbleist Jew. In any event, the rejuvenated Colmer was soon back in Europe looking for prospects when he met and converted the disgruntled Bavarian professor. Okay. So he's a Kabbalist Jew, perhaps. But you cannot separate a Jewish elites within this system as well with Rothschild. You might say, why is that? Because who, uh, who do you think God's prosperous blessing is upon? The Jews, right? 
So they're the elites, they're the rulers. Now you think they're all good people, they're going to obey God? No, if you, if, you get drunk, if you get so much blessed with power, That's you're right. going to abuse power. Yeah, right. Now before people get anti-Semitic and blame everything on the Jews, they don't look at themselves. That's right. That's now, where God blessed them with so much power or advantage, every man, woman, child, when they have so much advantage or power or blessing, tend to abuse it. That's right. Okay? That's why it's not going to be a surprise. There's always going to be uh, some Jew somewhere. Because they're very prosperous people. They have been uh, richly blessed by God, but they have abused it. Okay, anyway, continuing on. Webster writes, quote, Weishaupt, who combined the practical German brain with the cunning of Machiavelli, spent no less than five years thinking out a plan by which all these ideas should be reduced into a system. End of quote. Woo. Webster writes in her book, Secret Societies, quote, that Weishaupt was not the originator of the system he named Illuminism will be already apparent to every reader of the present work. It will be evident that men aiming at the overthrow of the existing social order and of all accepted religion had existed from the earliest times. End of quote. In order to get his Illuminati jump started as quickly as possible, Weishaupt entered the Masonic Lodge Theodore at Munich in 1777. Okay, so then... There is also masonry involved in this. Why? If you're going to have a successful, powerful society, you're going to have to connect with the best brains and elitists. And who are they? You got the masons, you got the Jesuits, and then you got the educated Jews or Jewish bankers. Think about it. If you're going to be a nefarious villain and want to take over the world, who are you going to learn from? Yeah. <laughs> That's just common sense. Continuing on. It was here that he found a band of renegade Masons who wanted more than the status quo. The French Mason Mirabeau divulged in his memoirs, quote, The Lodge Theodore de Bon Conseil at Munich, where there were a few men with brains and hearts, was tired of being tossed about by the vain promises and quarrels of Masonry. The heads resolved to graft onto their branch another secret association, to which they gave the name of the Order of the Illuminis, the uh, Illuminati. They modeled it on the Society of Jesus whilst proposing to themselves views di diametrically opposed. That's not a surprise. It's because in Revelation 17, the ten kings and the Roman church is part of the satanic elite system, but they always turn against each other. Why? Powerful people will turn against their own fellow powerful people. That's just history. Genghis Khan even did that. He made alliances and even turned against his own alliances. That's just common sense in history. So then, just because these uh, uh, trustworthy sources like Wikipedia said, when people say that there were Masons, Jesuits involved, no, that's not true. They were renegades. They were never part of that, the Illuminati. That's just dumb, man. That's just dumb. They don't know what they're talking about. They have a complete ignorance of history. You make connections and friends with such people. You, you can't escape from that, even though you turn against them. That's just inevitable in history. Anyway, continuing on. Um, la da la da la da la da la da la da. When they, uh, when we come to a review of the doctrines, philosophies, and operational procedures of Weishaupt's secret order, we are indebted to the thorough investigation of the Bavarian Police Department itself. Following the electrocution of Father Lang, when they raided the house of a certain Herr von Zwach, Cato, on October 11, 1786, confiscating numerous incriminating documents and then some. Here's what they discovered, the Bavarian Police Department. Quote, here were found descriptions of a strong box for safeguarding papers, which, if forced open, should blow up by means of an infernal machine, of a composition which should blind or kill if squirted in the face, of a method of counterfeiting seals, recipes for a particularly dead kind of, quote, aqua tofana, for poisonous perfumes that would fill a bedroom with pestilential vapors, and for a tea to procure abortion. A defense of atheism and materialism entitled Better Than Horace was also discovered. 
End of quote. After getting his own sister-in-law pregnant, the pervert Weishaupt makes a veiled reference to this abortion tea. When he states in a letter to Marius, quote, We have tried every method in our power to destroy the child, and I hope she is determined on everything, even D. He writes secretly, D. Professor Robinson asks rhetorically, can this mean death? Now, for some of you who don't know Robinson, he was that professor who heavily wrote a lot of documentations on the Illuminati and investigated it. And, of course, your trustworthy liberal Wikipedia source said, majority of scholars already confounded this claim and, it's and uh, we don't rely on it. Why? Why do, why do they want people not read it? Even if it's questionable, some of the stuff, why, don't peop uh, why make people not investigate it? Why discourage that? Here's another question for them. Why spend so much time disregarding or discrediting or trying to criticize any Masonic and Jesuit tie? Why spend so much time on that one? If you want to be fair and show the whole truth, nothing but the truth, why don't you show, show criticism but also their connections? You ever thought about that? Why do they have to pretend there's zero connections? That's what the kind of atmosphere they're producing. All right, anyway, continuing on. For the sake of skeptical Dito heads, Grady, Grady writes, the confiscated documents were subsequently published under the title of, quote, the original writings of the Order of the Illuminati. The authenticity of these papers has never been denied, nor even by the embarrassed Illuminati members themselves. The publishers, more, publishers moreover, we're careful to state at the beginning of the first volume, quote, those who might have any doubts on the authenticity of this collection may present themselves at the secret archives here where on request the original documents will be laid before them, end of quote. With reference to the sex, or, uh, to the sex doctrinal base, Weishaupt's originality can be traced to the French philosopher Jean Jacques Rousseau, who fantasized that civilization was a terrible mistake and that mankind's only hope lay in a return to nature. According to Rousseau, quote, the first man who bethought himself of saying, this is mine, and found people simple enough to believe him was the real founder of civil society. What crimes, what wars, what murders, what miseries and horrors would he have spared the human race who snatching away the spades and filling in the ditches had cried out to his fellows, Beware of listening to this imposter. You are lost if you forget that the fruits of the earth belong to all and the earth to no one. End of quote. Thus in his exhortation to Hierophants, Spartacus, a.k.a. Adam Weishaupt, writes this, quote, With the origin of nations and peoples, the world ceased to be a great family, a single kingdom. The great tie of nature was torn. See, similar to what he read from Rousseau. See, that's what he's mourning about. It's the people, the growth of civilization, that's the problem. Why do you think they want population or destruction, catastrophe, stuff like that? Think about it. Uh, within every war, then you get a prosperous economy after that. Yes. Even the recent one, they admitted it. That's what kind of temporarily saved or put a, uh, put a little halt on the decline of the economy. But it's still in bad shape. But even uh, liberal source papers were admitting that. Think about what happened after World War II when we finally had United Nations all under a one world system. How can we get such prosperity like that? See, people are very ignorant of their history. Do you recall the beginnings of history? When population grows so much more than the decline goes, especially growth of disease. And disease somehow spreads and gives that population decline. We saw that with the, I think, the Mayan civilization. See, these people are not stupid. These people know how they can continue their history and prosperous society. That's why I strongly believe in history. History is one of my favorite subjects. You can predict human nature from history. That's why dispensationalism is so important. Why? You predict human nature. You understand why the devil moved this way, why God operates that way, based on mankind's free choice decisions, what they've done. 
Anyway, okay, I've just given you a lot of nuggets on that one. You might think, like, what's the big deal of what you said? Trust me, I gave you a lot of gold mines on that. Just keep it in mind in the future. All right? It's going to be helpful for your own life. That's why I'm a big fan of history. It's very important. That's why I keep doing current events as well. I don't want to lose our history, see? I want to see where we're going, where we're headed toward. Anyway, this is what uh, Spartacus continued writing. Weishaupt continues writing. Now it became a virtue to magnify one's fatherland at the expense of whoever was not enclosed within its limits. Now as a means to this narrow end, it was permitted to despise and outwit foreigners or indeed even to insult them. Grady writes, 21st century hate crimes, <laughs> he calls it. <laughs> this virtue was called patriotism. So out of patriotism arose localism, the family spirit, and finally egoism. Diminish patriotism, then men will learn to know each other again as such. Their dependence on each other will be lost. The bond of union will widen out. Why do you think this anti-America thing that we're hearing right now, the weakening of America and its a civilization, but focusing on others is very important to elitists? Yeah. Why do you think liberal schools keep talking about Rousseau, Rousseau, Rousseau's nonsense? They want people to believe in that, accept that. Now, this patriotism has its faults. Absolutely. He's right. It produces egoism, selfishness. That's why it doesn't matter, Republican or Democrat, you're not going to bring in the right kingdom or a perfect kingdom. It's only Jesus Christ. Amen. It's only Jesus Christ. I'll tell you why Republicans are able to be prosperous so far and why even the beginning of America was prosperous. They won the American Revolutionary War. I told you over and over again, Baptist distinctive. That is so important. Okay, anyways, continuing on. Yada, yada, yada. Recruitment and discipleship. How did he do that? Next time on Discipleship Lesson, all right? So I will tell you next time how he recruited the followers and what happened after that one. But that was, uh, uh, that was the birth of the Illuminati, how they were able to come out. You see Masons, Jews, and then also uh, the Jesuits involved in this. So now you understand the tie. Now you see, now you understand the birth of all the globalists you hear about, right? That's why this is an important timeline right there. This was what gave birth to everything after that. Wow. This is the most important timeline for the, glo for the pyramid to begin. All right. Uh, what happened to the Illuminati and what happened after that, we'll, we will see next time. Father God, I pray that tonight's teaching was a blessing to the hearers, made us more wary of our history, and see that there is a battle of good and evil, and where we're headed toward. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.